And hey, 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 welcome to the Mise en Scene Weekly Podcast, where we hearken back to our college debate days and pick two movies of the same theme to don our red tails and pitchforks or flap away with angelic wings and golden halos. This week's episode is focused on, if you haven't guessed already, the afterlife with What Dreams May Come, taking on the Disney powerhouse of Coco. Come join Jonathan and Steven who we can't point to, for another week of desirably less plot chatter and hopefully more film banter, we are Scene Weekly, and welcome to our world. All right. Oh, it's going well. How are you? What's new? I just hit my head on a light, so this might be interesting, to say the least, uh, but I think I'm okay. I'm not throwing up yet, so there's That's that. Good. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty much going to be me as you've seen for the last 18 other episodes. Um, no difference. Good. How are I like you the doing? shirt. Further seems forever. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a good band. I like your short shirt, <laughs> although I, I can't really read it too much, even though you, I'm only looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you specifically pick this shirt out for this show? No, this is just a, a shirt that came, uh, came in the mail the other day. So it's the newest thing I own. So I just put it on. Is did you wash it? Do you wash clothes before they? Typically, complete? yeah. Yeah, typically I do. This time I didn't have time to do that. So it's just, uh, it's very stiff. It's okay. Interesting. It's not a soft shirt. And why did you buy that shirt? Did it randomly I, it come? Was, yeah, it was a random Instagram kind of like, oh, I like that, that, that design kind of thing. <laughs> it's good because I'm going to use it in the future as of you know, maybe an hour from now. Okay. We'll mm -hmm. go from there. But we're talking about the great unknown. Is it unknown? I mean, I tend to believe it's it's fairly known. I mean, I know all about it. Been there oh, you do? Once or twice. The afterlife. Yeah. Have you had any nope. near-death experiences? Um, Besides hitting your head just now? Uh, not really. Not. I mean, what, what's a near-death experience? <sighs> I don't know. It's, 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 uh, it's something where... My my closest thing I, I feel like that I've gotten besides being held up at gunpoint was <laughs> when I was surfing in Costa Rica or attempting to surf in Costa Rica. And I just didn't know if I was going to live or die because I was uh, I was kind of stranded. Uh, basically, I, I fell off a surfboard and with the force of the wave, the surfboard came back and punctured me in the back of the head and I was bleeding in the middle of the ocean and I had to swim back and I didn't know how bad the 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 blow was, or, or I just saw blood and I was like, am I, I believe you, you detailed this on the beach episode, but I could, no, we didn't. That. We skipped past it. Actually, we forgot to circle back to it. So mm. get to talk about it now. Um, yeah, that I, I left Costa Rica either that morning or the day, the night before. So I didn't get to, to assist in any way, shape or form, but you heard stories. That's a bit, that's a bit scary. Yeah. How was yeah. the doctor environment in Costa Rica? It was surprisingly chill. Um, it was like very, there wasn't really anybody in the hospital at the time. Uh, it was very low key. Mm. The guy, the doctor, uh, he studied in America. He spoke perfect English. Um, it cost like 10 bucks to get sutured up. It was, it was great. $10? Yeah. Yeah. How's your head now? Uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Wow. Interesting. Do you have a, a scar from it? Because I have a, I split my head open, um, and I guess this is the closest I can get to a near death experience. They had to shave my head, and I had you know like seven or eight stitches back there. But I'm sure there's a scar. I just I've never seen it. So you look really good with the shaved head. I think uh, we should kind of do what I do on a weekly basis because I would really, really enjoy that again. Yeah, yeah. That's I got. I got you. A... You haven't shaved since 2003, four, four. Yeah, Jonathan, I have a I have a five head, not a four head, so it's <laughs> it's not it's not the best look for me. It's not the best look. We uh back in college we decided to shave our heads for whatever reason because I don't know, we probably ran out of money, or at least I did, and I encouraged everyone to shave their head just like me. And so I did it. I first I can't remember, maybe Milt did it first, who knows? But Larry Gardner, who did like a clown haircut. Uh and after we did the two guard, we saw your head and we just couldn't stop laughing. It was it was just like bawling over with laughter. Um, and we collectively got together w without you knowing. And we we're like, we have to get him just to see what was going to happen if he shaves it to a one. And then you did. And we're like, 
we didn't know if it would look worse or better. So we just wanted to encourage you just to, in case it would look worse. And it did look worse, which was awesome for us. Yeah, so, thank you for that. And so, so thankfully, lovely. there's there's not too many photos flying around. This was well before I've got fa- one, Facebook, and, and we should <laughs> definitely edit it into this. One hundred percent. Oh my god, I I absolutely have the picture. I uh, I I know exactly where it is. It's not in an album, but I do have a box of pictures, and it's in there for sure. What's the What's the longest uh, you've ever had your hair? Like, where were you? How old were you? You know that answer. It was I think it was Korea. Korea. And this would have been 2006 to 2007. And for whatever reason, I just didn't know anyone over there. Went to go teach and went to go write a book and in the process of doing it. Um, also just smoking mad amounts of cigarettes in my house. So I basically was just like shut in for three months, writing a book, smoking cigarettes, not running clearly. And, uh, Parliament lights for two dollars and fifty cents, mind you, which is outrageous. I was like, everyone should smoke. It's just like effectively they're encouraging it. And then um, I just I just didn't want to go to a barber in Korea and a little scared. And I was like, I've never grown out my hair very long. Let's just see what it looks like. And uh, my hair grows extremely fast. So in nine months, it was like here. Um, and it was just too much. Got too much. And then I, I I had a girlfriend at the time. We, uh, she spoke Korean or speaks Korean. I, I would imagine. I don't even know where she is, but like she guided me to the barber. Basically, it was I, I gave them a picture. I wanted to look like the lead singer of Phantom Planet. I don't even know his name. And, uh, I showed them a picture of that and they, they, he cut it into it. And regrettably, I was, um, distraught and I don't have a picture. I should have taken a picture of this, but I, I looked like a straight up lesbian. I just looked so it, it was just the worst haircut I've had. And I had it for about eight minutes, went upstairs, looked in the mirror for like basically a split second. I was like, no, 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 this is, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. And then I explained, we, we went back down and two guard on the side and then just trim it at the top. It still looked poor, but I, it was better than looking like a lesbian in my, my view. That's true. I, we got to get a, a photo of your, your long hair on this podcast. So send that to me. I'll edit it in or we'll get Jamie to edit yeah. it in. I ha- I have a uh, I have a lot of pictures of of the long hair. Some with friends, some without. Do you do you think people get haircuts in heaven? Is that a thing? Because there's clearly jobs in these movies. But do you think hair grows in heaven? That's a, I don't you know that's a good question. And if life is a split second, I mean everyone's getting a haircut a few times a day or a few times a, a heaven's day. Yeah, it's a good question. Do you believe in heaven? Um, well, no. Do you believe a, in afterlife? That's a that's a tricky question that I'm not settled on. I just don't know. I don't know. I want to believe. I want to think that there's something more than this mortal world. Um, and people that have had those near death experiences have 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 had stories that there is something else. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but. Yeah, there's also, um, I mean, whatever you, people believe, you can you can go in, into the afterlife with doing DMT or mushrooms or a large amounts of mushrooms and, and acid, which uh, affect the the parts of the brain that are also affected during that those afterlife moments, if you will. Um, so yeah, who knows? It could be just a recreation, could be uh, something else. But I think ultimately speaking, we as human beings are just too dumb. To even understand, I mean, sixty-six percent of this universe is dark matter, and we have no idea what that does. How are we going to know what an afterlife is? And I think it's easier for us dumb humans to want to, as you and I'm including myself, by the way. Yeah. Um, I think we're just too dumb to ask the right questions, or even know what the questions should be to be asked. Um, and then what what information we would gather from those questions being answered, we still, I don't think, would really truly under understand exactly what's happening here. But nonetheless. I don't know either. Um, Do I think, these movies help answer any of that? No, not at all. No. Mm-mm. I think though, we'll get right into it. Yeah. I, I think that there, there is a, a certain collective consciousness with humans, uh, something I've read about extensively um, in religions extensively as well. 
But there's one fascinating thing that most scientists don't really discuss, but Carl Sagan actually had discussed this previously on where money should be placed in research in the future on things that basically haven't been researched very thoroughly that are also on the fringe elements of life. And one of them, I guess you can label as an afterlife effect or more importantly, or more specifically, it's um, children who remember their past lives, which is actually a book that I own. And one of the most fascinating things I've ever heard, and I first heard it in Intro to Philosophy when I went to, I was in my sophomore year in college, and that single class changed my perspective and changed my life and my idea, my parent, I mean, everything just completely shifted in that one single class. It was a wild, interesting ride. But with that said, this one example changed probably the trajectory of my life and my understanding of existence in the shortest amount of time possible with like a, a four page um, excerpt that the philosopher, the philosopher, I guess, had us read. And of that, I, and I don't remember the facts. I still have it. I didn't have time to actually go through my documents to get it. But actually, um, we could potentially, I don't know how useful it would be to show viewers, but I do have the, the still held paper um, upstairs. But what happened is, very specifically, and there are thousands of these cases in children who remember their past lives, and of which I believe, if memory serves, it's a boy from the Philippines or Indonesia. He dies, is allegedly reborn, and in his rebirth, once he starts talking uh, and can put like sentences together, he starts basically communicating who he used to be. And so the, the family was extremely weirded out uh, by the situation, specifically because um, it was more or less right down the street to, to some extent. And secondarily, he had very specific facts. The fact that he was uh, in the back of a truck, the back of the truck like tipped over, fell, and uh, the, the person burned to death. And so what was interesting when they started to the family, as well as uh, people that were like, this can't be real kind of thing, they collectively got together to do a massive amount of research on what he was saying, to see if it actually was true because it was very specific. And again, there's a ton of these examples. Um, I'll go into another one after this, but this is a mind fuck. Wow. The, the car tips over, burned to death, died. Now a new child starts speaking, starts speaking about that event and other facts of the, the person's life um, and who they used to be. And oftentimes, not oftentimes, at their age of eight, all of these stories and memories go away, by the way, like across the board, like they, they really are gone. Uh, they don't really, the kids don't talk about them anymore. It's like they re adapted to the new. It's like you forgot a dream. I did. And yeah, kind of. it's just gone. Um, yeah. I was going to go into this much later, but you, you asked and might as well get into it. But that changed my life. There's a second part to this that is the really crucial element, not just the fact that all these facts were true and the, the person could uh, confirm it, but um, the extremely fascinating where there are pictures in this article I can actually show you. He has the, the new boy has birthmarks all over his body that actually match the burn scars of what the previous person. And so there's thousands of these cases and Carl Sagan to go back to, to Sagan, he was like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what to believe or not to believe, but it's, there should be a lot of money sent this way to do research on this because I think that it would be very valuable. And there's another story and it's actually like maybe the BBC did a documentary on a little boy called Cameron McCauley. And he is a Scottish boy that very similar story. And all these stories are, are almost identical. When they, the kids start speaking, they start slaying these facts, basically. And he was like, uh, I used to live on this near the water uh, in this house that was he was explaining it into great detail, basically. Um, so much so he was like addicted. And so much so that the family was like, okay, like, I, I think we're just going to go there and, and fly. And basically, uh, they did that. And exactly to a T of what he said was, they literally found directions to this house. And inside the house, I believe they even found like, uh, remnants of, of his old self. These types of things, I think there's a, a collective consciousness for sure. I don't think it, you can explain away these types of uh, ideas. There's, there's sisters that have gone through this. Anyway, I've read the whole children's of children who remember past lives. It's it's some of the, it's pretty much the most fascinating thing I've ever heard of, um, and I don't think that indicates 
a an afterlife per se. I, I just think that there is this this commonality between humans, and I think you sometimes feel it more with friends that you connect with. You don't have to use language, but I think there is certain collective consciousness. But also, if you've ever researched outside uh, outside um, like OBEs uh, outside of your body experiences experiences, yeah. Or, yeah, so I myself have tried to do that as well. I think maybe we communicated with each other about this, but uh, I've been able to do that too. But there's also substantive uh, amount of research, not research, stories of people traveling, you know, in their dreams effectively and uh, visiting family members and waking them up and the, the person who's been woken up uh, feeling that the presence is there. Um, but you can still see uh, the individual, but, you know, those types of things, I don't know what to deal with or to do with it, but I do think that there's something else that we just don't understand, and it's a lot more complicated and uh, harder to comprehend, really. But that's the short end of it, the long end of it. Those are th- th- that's something new to me. I I, I got to get this book because um, it yeah. sounds very enlightening, and it just asks Weird. those questions: is is there a soul? Is, is there reincarnation? What does this all mean? Are we just? I, I, the idea of the collective conscious or unconscious. Yeah. Um, I mean, we are all connected. That's, that's a fact. Um, but it's to weird. what, to what level? Um, yeah. We're all made up of space dust as well. Yeah. But anyway, talking about Coco. And <laughs> we're going to go to Coco means. first, huh? Well, I mean, I, I went first last week. Do I, do uh, I, yeah. I went first last week. So, so yeah, this is our, uh, our second attempt to dive into animation after the uh, Oscar animation. Those are a double feature animation. But I chose Coco for my Afterlife movie, uh, 2017, directed by Lee Unrich. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, 97%, IMDb, 8.4. The budget of this was around $200 million, um, worldwide Jeez, box office. Uh, yeah, to, for an animated feature. God. 814 box office worldwide. Um, it's an all Latino voice cast. Uh, it's the, the, the largest budget with a, uh, all Latino voice cast, which is pretty incredible. Uh, the tagline for this film, the celebration of a lifetime. And my favorite, um, letterbox review on this is the top one actually is a story about death, murder, loss, grief, aging, dementia, living skeletons and deadbeat dads, you know, a kid's movie. Um, <laughs> yes. And it, it's pretty intense. Uh, it is intense, but I mean, kids' movies for for the longest time, from Disney Bambi to to everything, there's there's these themes of death and loss, and and um, you experience that at, at an early age through these films. Um, but nonetheless, the plot of not like this, not like this. No, this is um, this is more kind of Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole, um, confronting death face to face. Uh, but yeah, we meet yeah. we meet Miguel. He's a curious boy with big dreams of becoming a musician. The only problem is his family has banned music due to the trauma felt generations ago when their great great grandfather left the family p- to pursue his dream of becoming a musician. Miguel is determined, and when he finds an old photo that could prove his old relative is the hugely famous Ernesto de la Cruz, Miguel now believes it's his destiny to play music. During the Dia de los Muertos celebration, Miguel finds himself transported to the land of the dead. Now with only till sunrise to get back to the living, he has taken on a journey of discovery, which will ultimately provide answers and heal his family. So that's the plot. And yeah, it's a great plot. It's a great plot. Um, Out, by the way, outstanding introduction. Not by you, uh, of course, but the actual intro to the movie. Like <laughs> with... <laughs> <laughs> like cut paper the cut paper um yeah like flapping in the wind i really like i actually paused it rewound it uh and played it again it was it's just so cool how how far animation has like truly come it's been it was it was really fun to watch though um I, although i strangely enough i i hadn't actually seen this movie with sound or i shouldn't say that i only saw like 20 percent or something probably with sound and then um my like headphones on a plane broke and then i i just watched i just kept watching <laughs> was, and there's no subtitles so i c- i couldn't even understand like what was happening um 
well, I guess I could understand, but yeah. uh, so I rewatched it. I uh, hopefully, it the first hopefully time. it was it was better with sound this time around for you. Uh, you kind of, I mean, yeah, sound is better. a sound is a big element, obviously, of this movie with uh, the the heritage of music and 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 songs and what that means, and especially that last scene with the grandmother. But we'll get into yeah. that. Um, Have you ever written a song before? Have I ever written a song? Yes, when I was in uh, second grade, third grade, um, I had to do, I had to do, a uh, a song about, uh, we all had to do songs about States and I chose Hawaii. Um, and it was a very short song. I, I still remember yeah. it to this day. Um, I've written, yeah, a couple. A, you have, yeah, you play, you play I guitar. Believe- so you, you're probably a little bit more musically inclined than me. I believe you were in, included in the music video. Were you not? I, I don't recall. Well, Brian, Brian Harper and Mikey and Milt. Weren't you involved with like singing a, a bit of that song? I don't think so. Uh, I would re- I would remember that. Q4, you remember those days? I remember those days, yeah. So, I I was in a, a classic country music old by old Don Medeiros. He uh taught the class and I took that and in doing so we uh we had to write a, a what was feels like a classic country music song. Um I can't remember the title of it, but I still have the lyrics actually. Um, but we did a music video and I had to present it uh, to the class, which was interesting. To say I don't think I've ever seen this. Are you, oof, if somebody can find that video, that would be pretty fantastic. Another thing we should probably edit into this if, if it can be found, but that that's going to be, it's going to be a tough one. Um, but nonetheless, lovely music this time around. Yeah. I, so, Classic kind of setup, you know, we have Miguel, he's the main character and yep. his passion is the thing that can't, can't be pursued. Um, but he, he feels like it's his destiny to do this and he's going to do anything that he can to do, do what he loves. Were he's you ever, missed. were you ever. I guess as a kid banned from doing something that you liked, wh- whether it be like skateboarding or something like that. Yeah. That was my question for you, actually. Um, uh, I think, you know, as I said in previous weeks, the only banning of things was like just kind of nonchalant dig at my girlfriend at the time where it was like, you really don't want to marry somebody with the, that big of hips. Um, <laughs> so that was a soft version of it or soft hip version of it. But was I, I was never like a, a, I never got grounded. It just didn't happen for me. I think I, I, well, my sister was a damn saint and still is, but like my brother was just constantly pushing the boundaries. Oh, it's not even pushing boundaries. It's just like being in trouble with everything and everyone, basically. And then sometimes would occasionally get me, uh, get me banned from particular things if I was associated, but no, not really. There was nothing I I really couldn't do. And of that capacity, I mean, even I think we've talked about with, um, unsolved mysteries guy, or maybe, yeah, wasn't the unsolved mysteries guy, um, that had his head chopped, his, his son's head chopped off. Terrible. Oh, and, um, the satanic panic happened soon after that in the eighties. And my mom, cause I was blonde hair and blue. I, said basically don't go in forest or your head's gonna get chopped off and i'm like what and so you know a lot of people in florida had that same thing spit down the throat no in short i should have but i wasn't um in the 80s you were allowed to pretty much do whatever you you liked almost any kid does it like which is wild when you really think about it now of like helicopter parents um but no yeah going but out you. to play by yourself for hours on end around the neighborhood and, and the only the only thing was that was said was be safe and come back before it's dark and that, yeah. or like by dinner. And that's that was it. And there was no cell phones to check in. There was nothing. It was just like go, it, which is wild because like in Florida, I mean, we would just we would ride our bikes like 10 miles and, and as it and like not have any money either. Like <laughs> and if you got thirsty and you'd never take a water bottle, if you got thirsty, you would literally go. You either find a water fountain somewhere or like you see a garden hose and just turn it on at a business, somebody's house, had no idea who they were. Didn't matter. 
maybe maybe this is a Florida thing or maybe an idiot like myself, but um, it's just a free for all, which is yeah. lovely to be honest. Were you banned from something? Not really. I mean, it would mainly be like, uh, you know, music with bad language or something like that. But I mean, but no activities. Was, yeah, no, no activities really. Like I, my parents bought me a skateboard, got roller skates, you know, just had to wear a helmet, um, you know, all of those things. And like, it wasn't just a Florida thing. I lived all over the place. Like in Hawaii, we'd go spend, you know, like you said, till, till it got dusk just yeah. out and no, no supervision. And you're like in fourth or fifth grade. Like it's, I, I don't, I don't know what kids do nowadays, but I was, I, I was riding bikes at three and then by, and I thought I was going to be a professional, like BMXer, like just jumping and stuff. And I, I went wild, like so wild. So I started building ramps at an early age. I learned how to build like full bikes by like 10 years old. So I'm, I would just like tweak my own bikes and then I would make ramps and then I would make like very large ramps. I still have pictures of them actually, like like eight foot vert ramps, make like launch ramps uh, that were just so ridiculously outrageous. And my mom's like, ah, go have fun. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. I have scars on my stomach. I have yeah. scars on my leg from chunks being taken out, like literal chunks of like a full, like half inch deep. Uh, it just it injured myself galore, hit my head way too many times, didn't wear a helmet. And uh, my mom, I, I literally had a launch ramp that went into our, our retention pond that was behind our house when I was like 14, 13, and uh, do backflips into this retention pond and like tail whips and, and everything. And you really think about it, it's so disgusting. Retention pond, if you don't, you're not born and raised in Florida, from Florida, is the drain, the drain off of all the streets around you and uh, where it goes just sit. So imagine that. Imagine how disgusting that is. That's but gross. My mom, even then, yeah. was just like, "Go have fun, honey." <laughs> so, weird time. Anyway, yeah. Um, back to back to Coco, uh, Miguel. This is all centered on Dia de los Muertos, right? Yeah. And if you're not familiar with with what Dia de los Muertos is, it's obviously around the same time that we celebrate Halloween. It's a three day festivals, um, but it's it's a it's a it, interesting way of looking at death. Um, and it's also a very great way because you're, you're remembering those that have, have passed and you're honoring yeah. those that have passed. And it's a celebration of those people that are not with you anymore. And instead of thinking uh, of death as this, um, this very sad thing, which it can be, um, it's kind of turning it on its head and it's celebrating, uh, the, those that have passed. So what did you think about centering this movie on, on that, that cultural, uh, heritage? I love death. Yeah. I, I, th I told you and you probably got scared of me, but like, I, I think about death a lot, probably far more than uh, a normal human being and not in a um, sadistic way per se, but, uh, or even a scared way. Just um, I don't know. I like I like my brain to just take me to places that are fascinating and interesting. And for for whatever reason, I think death is is one of those items. And I think it's also well, I've gotten into just reading up on religions, um, read every single religious text uh, that there is for all religions, inclu including like Pastafarianism, <laughs> which is Possible. outrageous. I don't know. It's I don't know. It's basically it's a fake religion, but nonetheless, there is a um uh, text that you can read um i have it upstairs but nonetheless i um forgot your question but with that being said why don't we ask the question again just the, i got off the, topic immediately the idea of dia de los muertos and what it means um yeah to I, the film. I like the i like the fact of focusing on your loved ones that that meant something to you um and and having a moment in a focal point in a tradition. I, lo I love actual traditions. And, you know, when I was young, I would say traditions to me were like kind of cheesy. But then you later in life, you get to, to realize they're actually hugely and monumentally significant to the, the upbringing of children, effectively. And I think dealing with death and not being scared of death and making it into a tradition is so freaking cool. And I wish we, we had it to begin with. And I think, you know, Halloween for, for me, it was like, all the things of the satanic panic affected Halloween. So I never really got, I didn't like dressing up and that's probably why. Um, but I like the idea of focusing on, on uh, a tradition of death and the understanding of like 
you know, nodding to the, the, the former generation. Do you have anyone in your family that, who was your favorite person who has passed in your family? Um, last year, my, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side passed away. Um, and it was, it was pr- pretty much my first like close, uh, relative that had yeah. passed. Um, and that was very emotional for me. Um, and it was also like what touched me the most was going to, uh, the wake and everybody getting up on stage and speaking, uh, about him, whether it's, they knew him. Well, it was mostly people that knew him later in life. Um, mm. but that was, that was really, really touching because he was such a revered person and had such a big heart. Um, and it's tough to say favorite person, but that was the most affecting to me. And yeah. the fact that it happened when I, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to say that that happened when I was 38 years old. Um, yeah, some people, this lucky. happens to them when they're very young, um, whether that be a grandfather, whether that be a parent, whether that be a sibling. Um, and it's, it's something that I haven't had to look at head on. And I don't like, I don't think about death like you do, but within the past, within the past year, um, I've definitely had to face, uh, certain things. Um, and it's definitely had to, uh, I've had to deal with it a lot more, um, which, um, has been tough, but also it's something that, you know, you have to, you have to deal with, um, cause it's inevitable. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a, a very dear friend of ours pass away very recently in March. Um, suddenly that it was, um, I don't know. Old family members are very different than somebody who's mid thirties, um, passing away. Um, yeah. to me, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I guess my, my aunt and uncle, they passed away early two thousands and, uh, my mom's sister and then who she married. So my uncle Jack and aunt Dawn, terrific human beings. And also my mom's best friend. That was tough. Um, cause she was like, I guess the second mom to me, to some extent, she like, we, we couldn't have, my mom couldn't afford shoes for me to go to school. Um, so each year she would buy me a pair of shoes. Uh, she'd come down from, from Jersey or we'd go up to New Jersey on her dime, of course. And you know, she, she'd go, I don't know. It was like one of the happiest days of my life of like going shoe shopping for my one pair of shoes each year, um, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Uh, that was a tough one, but it was, um, it was like a teenager. So it was, it was more of a, or like barely outside of the teenage world. No, I was a teenager and um, it was a little different, I guess for me then I was more focused on my selfishly on myself. But I think last year, my uncle, um, my mom's brother died, uncle John, who was basically my dad uh, growing up. And, you know, we did everything together. We did father and son camps, even though he's my uncle. But yeah, his passing was tough, but he was old. He was fairly old in his 80s, um, kind of losing his his brain as my mom has. But um, yeah, death stinks. But I think it's something that we should focus on and not shoo away because it's inevitable. Yeah, and it made me think with like you said, what has happened in the past few months and last year with my grandfather is how, how people remember you and how people speak of you. And it makes you think about how you're living your life yeah, and how you want to be remembered. And it's death becomes death on somebody else also becomes personal on you because you're thinking about them, but you're also thinking about what, what are people going to say about me and how can, yeah, yeah. I make myself or how can I lead a life that is worth somebody speaking highly of me? Pasada I've already written um, the speech I'm going to say when you die. So that's going to be, <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I hear it please? I just, uh, yeah. But what to go back to Coco, what do you think being smashed by a giant bell would be like? Like if that, if that's the way you had to go, <laughs> like it seems like a really <laughs> shitty way. I mean, like quick, it's like I, I don't think it's a bad way to actually go out, but I do think for the people still living, it's a really bad way because it's like you're going to be hilariously mocked forever. Like you got crushed by a bell, <laughs> like a big giant <laughs> bell. Yeah, like yeah. huge. 
<laughs> yeah, Ernesto, uh, the uh, the music, <laughs> famous musician in this film, uh, he got crushed uh, twice, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it would be a, a horrible way to go. Um, but a quick, I, I would assume quick way quick, to go, yeah. uh, which is... How which would you want to go? Um, I... I, I I've thought about this. Um, not, not a lot. Cause I don't <laughs> think about death too much. Um, uh, either something quick, uh, like a giant bell or something very peaceful where I'm just, you know, slowly the pain is just going away and I'm falling asleep. That's or yeah. skydiving. I, <laughs> that's, I don't know. I don't know. There are people that live, but I guess if you, if you had to choose, you're actually dead, then that might be a good way. That just seems, uh, frightening um what about you it yeah i've thought about this a lot um i would actually for the people that are you know still living and they could if they want to find my body and do whatever you want to with it frankly i don't care um so i would i would tie a rope to my foot and i would uh go into the ocean and swim as far as i down as possibly uh, i can um, which is hopefully pretty far and then, uh, drown myself. Um, and then I could, you know, uh, probably float to the surface to some extent and I, I would be attached to this rope so people could find me. But, um, I hear that, you know, drowning is one of the, the easier ways to, to go about your, your death. Really? Death. Yeah. It's like pretty, or, or freezing to death. Oh, I wouldn't um, like that. Freezing. Mm-hmm. I love being cold. Um, we're not being cold. I should say, I just don't like being hot and I, I enjoy the cold. I like cold, cold water can go fuck itself, but, um, nonetheless, yeah, I think that would be the way I go. Yeah. Tying could a, you be, could you be dead right now and not even know it? And you're just in this possibly. existence that you think you're doing a podcast possibly, but I think the fact, yeah, I mean, you could, you could, I have some quotes on this in terms of, uh, what dreams may come here in a second, but could be. Yeah, we could already be dead. Um, back back to the movie because this is a film podcast. Um, but I, I, you know, this is a podcast Stop also it with where a film podcast. Yeah, come on. Yeah, we're talk, we're talking about movies. Come on, talking about movies. Um, I do like the twist in this movie. Um, I remember what when twist? when I first watched um, it. It was surprising to me. I didn't see it. I didn't see it coming. Uh, but the twist is Miguel. He he finds this this photo and and the land of the the living in his his life and there's a uh it, it's it's not all there there's um it's ripped off the top because his great great grandfather um supposedly left the family to pursue his his musical career now he sees the guitar and thinks well that's ernesto's guitar ernesto must be my great great grandfather um turns out well he goes to the the land of the dead and searches for ernesto finds him um uh, but this whole time, he also meets Hector, and Hector is in a crisis because uh, he is about to be expelled from the land of the dead and no longer have any sort of existence, whether that's living or dead, because he's going to be forgotten. Uh, because Coco is the only person that remembers him, and this reveals that Ernesto and Hector were friends, uh, musical partners, um, and Hector wanted to go home to his family while Ernesto wanted to continue with the musical career, but he couldn't continue because he wasn't the brains behind the operation. Hector was Hector was the one that wrote all the songs. Yep. Ernesto was a good singer, but he was not the brains of the operation. Um, so what does he do? He poisons him, takes his music, Hector dies. And what happens through family legacy is that they feel like Hector left them, but it wasn't, it wasn't the truth. Ernesto was the one that manipulated it all along. And he turns out to be the villain in this story. Dun, dun, dun. That was, yeah, it was a big twist. It was a big twist. And I, I liked it. I liked how they presented it. I liked how um, there was a mystery that it was, that he had to discover. And, I felt that the the musical tie-in, especially with the the song that they wrote, "Remember Me, Recuerda Me," was was fantastic. I loved I loved it. It's great. I, I, I both of these movies that deal with death. This is the one that I actually I actually cried at, even on this watch. 
I did. You don't have kids, uh, but yeah, they're both they're both pretty sad um, to say the least. But yeah, have have a kid and then watch what dreams may come. And it's just Sony and I were both crying. Um, but yeah, they're both. What, did, sad. what yeah. did you What did you think about the depiction of the the land of the dead? And in, in this film, so fucking cool. I mean, both both movies actually were were ridiculously fun and cool to even like think about. Um, Again, I would pause and be like, that is so intricately detailed. And the amount of work that went into it is like, I mean, I guess 200 million. This is what 200 million dollars gets you, right? Um, But you can clearly see that that 200 million dollars was definitely used very wisely. But it it was just so intricate. Like, for example, um, like the bridge and like the Miracle Bridge. Yeah. It just, uh, I mean, I can go into like different examples of things, even like the, the bell dropping, um, just everything to do with it. And uh, I would often like close my eyes and just stop using visuals just to see what the sound was like. And um, when he was like in that cave, uh, like looking up at the sky and just listening yeah. to like the water slapping, uh, I was like, this is really cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it evokes a feeling for sure. Not just of the, the death scenes, but the, the visualization as as well as the combination of sound that they did it excellently. Like one of the best. Yeah. Super cool. I agree. Why didn't you, by the way, why didn't you play any instruments? If you're family um, or musicians? Because it, speaking of kind of uh, what family passes down to you, um, not necessarily trauma or anything like that, but like I said, <laughs> when, when my, when my dad was growing up, um, he was kind of like you, like wanted to, uh, play sports and do all of these things. But my, my par- grandparents wouldn't allow him to play sports because they thought he would get injured. Uh, or so the, the story goes. Um, so yeah, yeah. he was pushed into music. Um, and me growing up, my dad wanted me to play sports, do the things that he, he wasn't able to do. Because later in life, my dad started doing triathlons and um, was very active, um, taught yeah, me how yeah, to play yeah. soccer. Um, all of those things. So I got pushed into the sports realm and I didn't really get into the the musical side. Every time my dad tried to teach me guitar, it was like this thing where he would just take the guitar and just start kind of showing off and not really teaching me. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand chord progression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Son, do you know about chord progression? Let me just show you this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, this so. isn't fun anymore, Dad. That makes um, sense. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't forced to to do any uh, to do anything. My mom almost forced me to have what was it called? Some like dance class in seventh grade, and I was extremely shy, very shy at that moment, and like I did not want to to go dance with other people at school like like ballroom dancing and i was like this is, this is not at all what i would like to do and you had a performance like after months and i was like that was like one moment i was like can i can i just die like right now like there's this no is way. not your thing yeah i went from basketball to ballroom dancing is there another b sport or item i could do I, well you know what i bet if you stuck with the ballroom dancing with basketball like your basketball would improve <laughs> so uh what's his name vasily lomachenko is a ballroom he's like a ukrainian dancer as well as uh who quit boxing basically because he's a professional boxer um to do this specifically uh to get better footwork for for boxing which more or less works but i think he's had a few losses but most consider him to have like some of the best footwork in the world I didn't get into boxing and I don't know if that would help my bat. I guess it would help my basketball. It could. Yeah. Who knows? It might. Why don't I start now and see how that works out? But I, I, inter- I want to say that I want to say this as just a, I guess a, a little tidbit. And one thing that wasn't a part of the trivia, it also wasn't a part of uh, virtually anything that you're going to find. It was just my own connection that I, I've seen this movie in terms of all the Hispanic cast or Spanish speakers as well. It, um, it made me it made me feel good and this isn't like some DEI initiative like liberal thing I'm I'm pushing but it, it it's very nice to see this actually come out and just and so well executed it's not like this is just a, I mean it's 200 million dollars so but they could have flubbed it you know like black adam they could they could have made expensive. it they could have made it feel more like a uh like a a 
a tourist Americanized version or edition yeah. of what Mexican heritage is all about. But they actually did the research and the work and went down to to Mexico. And then, so I think one thing that that backfired on them actually helped them. Whereas, um, did you hear about the uh, instance where Disney in 2013 requested to trademark the phrase Dia de, la, de, de las Muertos? Uh, for merchandising applications. This was met with criticism from the Mexican-American community. And um, they, they basically <laughs> they basically uh, depicted a muerto mouse depicting a skeletal Godzilla-sized Mickey Mouse with the byline, it's coming to trademark your culture. Um, so Disney backed off. Nice accent. Said, yeah, they, 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 uh, they didn't uh, trademark Dia de los Muertos. Um, and then they, they actually hired some... Uh, some people from Mexico to actually help with the cultural uh, aspects of this film to give it more authentic authenticity, which I think helped uh, in the long run of this film. So, yeah. So it's cool. What I, what I was trying to get at, um, there was an interview, separate interviews and then Charlie on Charlie Rose where um, Spike Lee is talking about Quentin Tarantino and Quentin Tarantino is talking about Spike Lee and basically they're being asked about each other's movies in the nineties and they're both of course saying very good things. And Spike is like, you know, people are now cop. You see like basically people copying uh, Tarantino because, you know, nobody had seen the reservoir dogs before Pulp fiction. Um, and so of course when people like things and it's new, they're going to try to copy that. And that was like the first part. And the second part, Charlie Rose is asking Quentin Tarantino, his thoughts on just Spike Lee's general movies. Of course, he's a, Again, saying good things about him, but this is where it directly ties back to Coco, and I appreciate. But he was saying, um, in like the eighties, for she's she's got to have it. Like, so I was contemplating about like why that movie was so big to the black community, and he was just like, I don't think like black community was ready for this. It was like so overwhelming, and when he would watch um, in theaters his movie with other people, like black people. And yeah. literally, it was like an overwhelming emotion. People like seeing black people kiss, uh, sometimes even for the first time. Like there haven't been like black focused movie in forever, basically. And so, I like the idea of building up and having more screen time, if you will, for even though this is an, an animated film, um, more screen time for individuals that may may or may not have it had it in the past but it's it's a really nice thing to see and it's also something that i think should be noted in our culture across or cultures around the world in terms of not necessarily the the tradition of it but just the idea of death and people should not just like think about death at the very end of your own life but um or the the very end of your your parents but i think it's it's cool to think of it in this way and i like i like pretty much everything that was to do with this movie Awesome. Actually, I don't and know. It's like a dislike, to be fair. And I agree. I think, I mean, from a uh, male white American, um, I, I do think representation matters, and I think that it is important for um, for people seeing a version of themselves or their culture on screen uh, being represented in this way. Um, it's really important. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. A lot cool. of fun. Like I, I wish there was maybe a second version to this. But I, I really enjoy animated films, which is interesting because like you um, if you like actually critique all animated films, like the uh, the actions are you know different than humans, the way they move, you know, facial expressions and things of that nature. But we still are able to very much connect uh, like up, for example, one of the saddest moments in film history. But we were able to like still connect uh, sometimes even like on a deeper level because um, you're allowed you're allowing yourself to like. It's not just somebody dying. Uh, it's, it's a cartoon dying. So it's like you're allowed to go deeper, I guess, to some extent into your, into your emotions and feelings, possibly. Anyway. I like that. It yeah. was fun. Yeah. It was fun. And um, it, it's it's interesting, you know, pairing these two movies against each other. It's just, it's interesting pairing a anim, animated movie versus a, a you know, real life movie uh, with actual actors. Um and I, which I haven't seen What Dreams May Come, or I hadn't, uh, since it came out and I saw it in theaters. And so I <laughs> I remember, and I've only seen it one single time, 
And so when we, when we found ourselves with the afterlife, instantaneously I thought of this movie because I, and there's, I don't know, there's so many, there's also a lot of shitty movies in the afterlife uh, spectrum of things. I won't list them, but like um, this one immediately came to mind, but I didn't know if this was going to hold up even remotely because if memory served before I was like, wasn't there a lot of like visual uh, like usage of like, you know, I remember the painting and, and, and Robin living out his world in the painting of his wife. And then I was thinking that can't look good now, because if you think of like Harry Potter in like 2001, the first, yeah. it, like the graphics are so garbage when you go back to look at it or watch it now, which I do like every year. But I was like, there's, and this is like three years before that. I was like, there's no way this is going to work out well. But it actually did. It was shockingly uh, good visually. There was a couple moments uh, in hell where I was just like, this is, this is kind of silly. But um, that's what happens when you have the early onset of, you know, uh, digital art being made, I guess, to some extent. But anyway, yeah, I, 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 we can talk more about like the, the, the visual style of this film and just the, the art direction um, and the idea behind it. I thought like w when you think about movies of the afterlife, this one jumps out because of those visual images that you remember, you know, 25 years ago or whatever it may be um, that sticks with you. And that's, that's powerful. So the fact that, you know, rewatching it now and it still, still holds up visually uh, it just adds more to the legacy of this film. And legacy of Robin Williams, man, I um, just was so sad because I mean, and I'll get into the synopsis, but it just, um, there's some facts that I have later that are just like, so like very depressing, but I, I just, you know, Robin taking his own life um, and in, in the movie, he dies as well. And I'll get into a few other things, but I, in terms of the visual side to this, it was actually, it's actually one of the few films, I didn't know this, uh, that was shot on Fuji Velvia which is RVM film stock. I have no idea what okay. that means to be fair, but it's a type of film used uh, for like still photography of like landscapes. So we, they were trying to replicate like what a landscape or a painting or a landscape and try to morph what a painting or picture would be so that it would look, I guess, more realistic to what they were trying to attempt to do, which I think they, um, they did very, very well um, in my view. But um, here's the, uh, here's the breakdown. What Dreams May Come, which is a, a uh, line from Shakespeare uh, inside of, I believe, one of his sonnets. But um, It's to be or not, not to be soliloquy, yeah. Oh, is it? Um, runtime is 113 minutes. Director is Vincent Ward. 1998 PG-13 fantasy romance. 52% of Rotten Tomatoes, which the audience um, meter, I think, is like 83%. IMDb is uh, 7 out of 10. I almost don't even want to do IMDb scores anymore because like, they just don't make sense at all. It does, yeah, yeah, I don't just, get it. Like, I, I don't understand their numbers, both on good good movies and bad movies. I just I, I just I can't really register. Rotten Tomatoes seems to make a little more sense. The budget was eighty five. Didn't do well in the box office. Uh, definitely a uh, niche type of movie, um, and seventy five million in the box office. But with that said, you'll understand why a lot of people I would imagine immediately are like, I'm, not only am I not going to go as an adult to watch this movie because I don't want to be embracing of this, which I originally in 1998 when i saw it i was like if you start off a movie as they want as they did um people are going to be turned off but it's interesting because the both time i've seen it i wasn't turned off it was a roller coaster of a first six minutes i'm just yeah. gonna say that like yeah. the credits haven't even been off the screen and everyone's and, dead <laughs> well this is what we get we get you know them bumping boats in switzerland yeah having you know a, a very brief encounter uh, who, wh why are they alone on boats in switzerland i don't know who knows don't worry about that I, got, i've been on a boat i've been on i've been on alone on a boat in switzerland in zurich okay like, like yeah yeah so this these you rent boats this and that's where you met sonia right this is <laughs> where you did you have a beautiful wig on too she wouldn't be on about? a boat first of all <laughs> how did you two meet by the way that's that one of my questions that means How did you be out, out, outdoors, and if she were outdoors, something is wrong, <laughs> like she's being abducted by somebody, probably me. Um, how we met, we met through my friend Nanny. Um, Nanny invited me to go out. Well, I mean, 
long story short, Nanny was dating Sonia's good friend and they wanted to go out and I was staying with Nanny uh, for a few days and because I was renting my apartment on an Airbnb to make some money. And so he's like, oh, I'm going out. It's like a Friday night, Thursday night, Friday night. I can look it up. But and he was like, I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. And he was wanting me to go out with him. I was like, ah, I kind of want to just stay in. I'm tired, which is something I at that time, I don't know why I would even say that. And then I decided to go and uh, I, I have a whole story actually written about this and our first encounter. And then I was introduced to Sonia's other friend, Christina, first. And then um, we talked for a little bit. And then Sonia was just like in this corner being all shy. And then uh, the second I started talking to Sonia, I was like, oh, this bitch is interesting. We have <laughs> way too many things in common. This is very odd, like very strange. We were talking about my MMA and Mikel Foucault and she knew we were sociology majors. And I was just like, there's too many things, similarities here. Uh, she's a lawyer. And I was like, this is very odd, very strange. And then I, I literally turned to Nanny. I was like, did you inform her of my likes? Like, what what is happening here? This is like, very did you set me up here to like, yeah. Yeah, like for success? And I was like, I don't know if I like this. And I actually thought like that. I kept talking to Nanny. I was like, did you did, did you tell her this? Like, this is very odd. Yeah, and then within two weeks, I was like, yeah, we're going to get married for sure. Or like, we're going to be, this is it for me. Like, wow. in, in, like an immediate desire. Of like, yep, she's she's it, and I still feel that that way. Just like um, this film, yeah. So after uh, our boats bumped, we got together. But nonetheless, after Chris Nielsen, who is Robin Williams, he dies in a car accident very quickly, early on in the movie. He is gift. By the way, this is from a, a book, and I believe that. Uh, go ahead. Well, we didn't even talk about the okay. kids because I mean, we're we're minute four, we'll minute five. We get to meet the kids. They I'm reading the synopsis. You dim, you dumb dumb. Okay, all right. All right. So Chris Nielsen, Robin Williams, dies in a car accident. He's guided through the afterlife by a spirit guide, Albert. Fantastic. Cuba Gooding Jr. This new world is beautiful. It can be whatever Chris imagines it to be. Even his children are there, who have both passed away from a car accident. But when his wife, Annie Annabella Scoria, who did not want to be a part of this movie after she heard about it, uh, commits suicide and is sent to hell, um, Chris ignores Albert's warnings and journeys there to save her. And upon arrival, Chris finds that rescuing Annie will be more difficult than he had imagined. That synopsis is actually really good for like a few sentences. Pretty much encapsulates everything to do uh, with the movie. But very tragic. Off the bat, the two kids die. In the book, there were actually four children. But oh, wow. off the bat, the, the, the kids pass and Robin passes in a car accident um, in a tunnel. And and the wife is is left alone. Um, I can't imagine. I just i i uh, i think I think immediately I would probably yeah I'd immediately say I want to kill myself. Like I, I truly couldn't imagine losing my daughter and then losing my spouse in That's... a short period of time. Like I, I don't. I, how do you move on from that? I don't, I don't, I, you can't, you, there's no way to move on. I mean, yeah, this is. So starting a movie with this is like anyone, anyone that tries to hook you with like the kid dies first or any of those movies, I'll almost always turn it off. Like, ah, nope, not watching this. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, I, I, sure. That, but for some reason, and I think it's probably because there was zero connection at the very beginning of the movie with the, the kid or the kids. That it's able to work uh, better, but um, anytime you start a movie with just people getting axed is that was not the best way to go. That was one of my things on this on this watch because I, I haven't seen this movie in the same amount of time as you, just once in the theaters. But um, I felt like it being such, and I, I see your point now uh, of there being very little exposition and very little time spent with these characters that it's easier to digest, um, and that I, I like your point on that, but. I was also kind of wanting it not to be rushed as much and spend a little bit of time knowing who these people are um, and getting getting more of a, an emotional connection to them would help serve the film better down the road. You think so? Because I, I, like, I liked it more focused on the relationship with the, and the relationship of love and just the idea of love with the, the, the parents. Um, 
and and Robin still just being directly connected to the idea of how much he loves his his wife and wants to help her. Um, do you do you believe in soulmates? No. Not not even remotely. I think I mean maybe you can have many soulmates, sure, people you can just deal with. Um but no. <laughs> people that you can just deal with. Yeah. I don't I don't <laughs> I, see I it. tolerate you. Uh you know, 10 hours of the day that I'm awake, most days you're fine. Isn't that what love is? I both both on a friendship level and uh a a, a spousal level, isn't that exactly what love is tolerating (laughs) understanding yeah i mean every single day with friendships or with your spouse there is a negotiation happening either in your brain or theirs or both of understanding and accepting and moving past things that may hurt or harm you and never stepping on the boundaries too much and so to me that's just you're tolerating and the people you don't tolerate are not your friends and the people you don't tolerate are not your spouses. And I think the more you can tolerate a human being probably closer to that individual, whether they're a friend or, or a spouse. And what I, I, that might I be, see that might it's be, not very romantic of a, of a uh, description, but I see, I see nothing your point. is when you break it down with words and words that like you actually get down to the nitty gritty strict definition of things it's nothing is romantic that's why there's poetry jonathan that's why there's poetry yeah but but that doesn't get down to the essence of it uh in my view that gets down to the the conflation of ideas and feelings on paper of like what things represent to me at least as somebody who is i I would consider myself to be a poet and a lover of poetry um poems to me like evoke feelings um and imagery but if if you get down to like anyway getting off topic well off topic but it's an interesting concept where albert cuba getting junior fantastic unbelievable performance and as well as for robin williams um but one in which i just can't i can't stop thinking about the whole robin williams thing because in this in his performance here i don't know why i and i don't know many other people and i can't even actually think of a single other person maybe like robert redford but not in the capacity of of robin williams um, he just seems like the type of person because he gave a lot to, to homeless individuals and on all of his films, he he wanted um, to help the homeless community and just help seems like, seemingly like all communities. And I just feel like he gave so much to other people. And there's a Korean word for it that I is escaping me. But Sonia, while watching this, was like, he's got this this look. I mean, Sonia's grandmother said, I have this look. Basically, you can tell a person's nice. Um by just like looking at them, There's, I guess, and I don't know if psychopaths are able to have this. Maybe I'm a psychopath, but um, <laughs> Robin Williams has that look. Uh, I'll have to get this word for you. But in for these individuals in real life, um, I feel like he just gave so much to other people. He just had nothing left for himself. He had nothing, nothing to to go back to. No, not to say identity, but he just he provided all of his existence to other people. He did, which is which is very sad. Um, and I have a, a a little trivia here for you. But when when his character Chris Nielsen is with his dog Katie and comes across Albert Lewis, who is standing in the water, Chris recognizes him um, in his youth. And Albert exclaims, "You last saw me when I was sixty three, stretched out in a cardiac ward. Who wants to be sixty three throughout eternity?" And Rob, Robin Williams actually passed away at sixty three. Um, oh wow, two thousand fourteen, which is eerie but do you when when celebrities die people that obviously you've never met or have any kind of personal connection do you get sad do you have like a moment of grief no No. um hunter s thompson yes that was like uh yeah i didn't like the i did not like that at all hunter s thompson i think um how did he go he killed himself Football season is over. Um, shot himself while typing that. That was his last line. Football season is over. Basically said his body wasn't working as well as he wanted, um, which I understand. People thought when he shot himself that he uh, they dropped the book in his, his office. Um, I actually bought that same exact typewriter, his red um, typewriter that he used as IBM Selectrics. Anyway, three. 
And uh, no, not really. No, no, I don't know them. I have no connection to them. Um, I can't, other than Hunter S. Thompson, I can't really think of uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Another one, I guess that that actually hurt me. Um, not really. Mine are, no. What about mine you? Are, mine are a little bit more uh, more impactful to me. Not necessarily I grieve them, but the the sense of like suicide in Robin Williams, is shock, shocking to me. Anthony Bourdain, <clears throat> shocking to me. Um, Heath Ledger. It wasn't suicide. It was an accidental overdose, but still shocking to me. Um, those are the three that kind of like really stick out. The overdose, they don't, um, or even the overdose or suicides, for whatever reason. What's his last name? Bradley from Sublime. When, yeah, uh, I think so. he accidentally overdosed on a speedball. Like that, that uh, in. Um, Kurt Cobain when I was in seventh grade, that as well was shocking because I just love their, both their music, but yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's the, the overdose side of things is like somebody just trying to, they've got demons and, and also like Philip Seymour Hoffman, um, whether they're trying to do it or not. I just think that, uh, I don't know. I think of generally speaking, I don't feel too bad or sad. Because I think that these individuals that are living on the cusp of reality are pressing themselves so far and they've created an art that is so lasting that if they even, they are the way that they are and they have committed suicide or accidental overdose because they're on the fringes to begin with. And the art that they have left behind is, is here for a lifetime. But with that being said, you know, I, I think Tarantino is metaphorically doing it to some extent to himself by limiting the fact that he's going to create 10 movies. I mean, that just to me is like a suicidal moment without actually performing the act. Um, so you're killing your, your kind of career. Silly. It's kind of dumb. I don't care about his career. I just I care about viewing more films, but I think the people that have committed suicide have provided much, much more to the world, especially in the, the celebrity dumb environment than uh than not i don't know if that makes any sense whatsoever but i'm picking it up feel too yeah. bad i don't think I, like amy winehouse i i don't didn't like her music but it's sad of course but uh if i were to be sad on every single person that's that that died that i don't know well i my life is miserable going forward right right i sound like do you do you um an utter asshole do you <laughs> yes you do uh do you gravitate more towards Robin Williams comedic performances or his um, dramas hundred percent his dramas yeah oh my god I mean Mr. you get, you get old, I don't know does his does know. his shtick get a little old his like no know, his, his... I love I like his comedy um, but I mean Mrs. Doubtfire is a mixture of the two but um this was just after Goodwill his... hunting his drama, yeah, his drama is is fantastic. I mean, he's one of the, I I created a list of my top twenty five actors, and Robin Williams is one of my favorite actors of all time. That's great. I, I mean, I'll I'll pull up that scene from Goodwill Hunting where he's having that conversation with Matt Damon, and I, I'll just watch it once a year just to see that. Like, have you seen Dead Poets Society? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I haven't seen it in many in a long time, but uh, another one that I would just I, I'm writing it down so I remember this. So I, I actually do want to watch this and, and fix Death it. Death to I Smoochie. Have, I, I haven't seen it but once and I haven't seen it and nor do I remember much, if at all. No, I remember some stuff, but like not enough. Um, yeah, Dead his, Poets? He, yeah, he's one of the best actors um, ever. Full stop. In my view, I just think I, I love him. I also probably rate him highly as well i just think i do think he's a a great person and i think it very much comes across that he is a good person not only in this movie but in in all other movies that he's in he just seems like a very kind like toys you ever seen toys um just seems like a very kind uh human being but boy not to you know um i don't think there's a whole lot to go into detail of exactly the you know semantics of the movie itself but like the purgatory or whatever you want to call that he's in and being able to transition 
um, being able to have anything and almost everything at once, but you are choosing to, to be with your wife throughout all of this is um, it's just like a, it's a very romantic feeling in my view, but it's interesting. It made me feel a lot like two other movies and maybe those two movies have kind of, they all got together and they're all like trying to do the same thing. But strangely enough, have you seen the fall, which is one of my favorite movies of all time? Somebody brought this up to me the other day and I don't, is it with Kirk Douglas? Who's in it? Um, mm -mm. It's with, but no, uh, I haven't seen it. It's with Lee Hammond. Is that his name? What's his name? Lee. He's in uh, the Hobbit three movies. He's the 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 king of the elves. Uh, okay, gotcha. Right? Um, with the blonde hair, yeah. Lee something or other, but nonetheless, I can't remember his name clearly. Lee Pace. Lee Pace. That movie is a mind meld of. I don't know. We should definitely add this to a list of like where we're going to go, but it's just like the mystique of things. And it also reminds me of something called the cell with Jennifer Lopez, which is her best movie by far, in my opinion. And okay. I absolutely adore the cell. And I also love movies that, that mix reality in a visual way with like dreams. So like quite literally he is, you know, is he dreaming? Is he not dreaming? Who knows? Um, is he dead? Yes. But, or is he not dead? Who knows? What is, is he what a ghost? Is our, Does he haunt what people? Is our, yes. Yeah. What, what, what is our soul? Actually, I, I did clearly think about that when she is painting still after everyone has passed away and he becomes part of her painting and, and wants to interact with his wife and um, it's just making him more depressed, clearly. And Albert was warning old Chris that, you know, this is going to make things worse. But would you? Because like me personally... I don't think I would want my wife to come back and hang out with me. I think uh, just it would be because you're not there anymore. You're a different thing. And if it is just this collective consciousness and feeling communication is as they you could see in the movie, extremely limited and uh, not limited. It's just like virtually impossible. And it's kind of learning a new language. You, you pretty much have to, to learn the Morse code to be able to communicate at this point by like turning lights on and off. But would you want a, a spouse to come back and hang out? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, it, it it feels more like a like a haunting rather than a yeah. kinship. <laughs> yeah. I mean, taking the pen and having her write "I still exist" that would creep me the fuck out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because even if you you're not you're you're there in spirit, but that that is just a feeling of again what I'm what what I'm without and it would remind me constantly of what i'm without yeah it's uh i wouldn't like it yeah i mean i've talked to my wife uh if i passed away she i mean she's probably much more extreme than i she would have to sell the house probably burn all of my belongings never ever she'd probably delete all pictures of me she'd go to the ends of the earth to ensure that uh, she is not reminded because she probably um, there would be no Dia de los Muertos for John. No, no picture no. at the altar. <laughs> no, <laughs> there, no. Um, it'd be tough though. But nonetheless, I, I, um, I wouldn't want somebody to come back. But do you ever do? You, do you remember many of your dreams these days? Um, yeah i i dream I dream quite frequently. Um, I don't. I do remember it's like one of those things where you you vividly remember your dream right when you wake up and then yeah. as every minute passes it's gone and gone and gone. I do have a write it down. Yeah, I do have a dream that I um I mean I remember from my youngest age like 2 or 3 that mm -hmm. probably 3 um that still sticks with me that I've oh, never wow. forgotten. Yeah. I have I have uh, recurring dreams as well. I have I had a dream book for a bit when I was doing the OBEs or try attempting to um yeah, lots of tornadoes, strangely enough. And tornadoes. There's no tornadoes, tornadoes in fire. Florida. Yeah. I almost got what are you talking about? I almost got hit by a tornado in Florida, like right down the street from my house. Oh, really? I thought just hurricanes. Yeah. Didn't know tornadoes. No, it was a tornado. Yeah, I think tornadoes exist pretty much everywhere. Um that could be completely wrong. But it it reminds me of 
th there's this weird story that Sonia like likes to think of me, and uh, I don't know how this is going to even play out, but I was just thinking of the painting of you know Robin Williams trying or his best to be with uh, his former spouse, or I guess uh, maybe current spouse, his wife. And uh, he's running towards her, which was super interesting because like he was, you know, told basically that he can do or have anything he wants almost to some extent in this, what he thinks to be somewhat of a heaven with the old Cuba Gooding Jr. But when he was running, it when his, with his hands back, oh, yeah, the, the, it reminds the me, yeah, it reminds me of your shirt of uh, anime runners like getting after it. But I, I, was, I was like, that's hysterical, but I was never one to, to like animate um, with that being said. Never was able to get, to get into it, um, but nonetheless, the the intimation or the the feeling I actually had it, for some reason it was like the fall, it was like the cell, but it also reminded me a little bit of Inception of, of the and especially Dante's Inferno. If you've if you've read Dante's Inferno, Hell was very much Dante's Inferno of like the the different rings. Not there were thirteen, but it was super fascinating in how they actually filmed um, large swaths of this movie, especially the hell parts where she's like getting to that house to begin with. And he can only spend a, a few minutes until he himself is going to be trapped in hell. She's not going to remember, you know, allegedly she's not going to remember him, but he tries um, his damnedest to, to get her out. But it just kept reminding me of, of Dante's Inferno, but also a little bit of like inception of like, you know, the, the mind molds of, going deeper and deeper and what that looks like on the screen, which I think uh, both Inception and this movie did quite well. The The effects still were great. I really enjoyed them I, much more so than I, I thought they were going to be. But it was such an emotional roller coaster, not only from the beginning, but also towards the end of like getting his his wife back. Um, to be honest, everything was like happy go lucky at the end. But like a, I feel like a Korean director could take this and do a, a new rendition and crush in a, in a Korean feeling movie. It would be like a fit. It'd be a fantastic film. Um, you pretty much just pick and choose any Korean director. To be well, it's because the themes of this film are so, so big life, death, trauma, suicide, or uh, hell, uh, what that means, where you're at. the, what did you think of the kids when he meets his kids or when they're revealed in, in his heaven? How did you like, how, how did, how did that play out? You mean like when, when it was raining and he's talking to his son or the times where the kids are manifesting themselves in hell to say like, you know, you got to go back basically what, which one or both. Well, basically you're in heaven is your own, your own heaven. Chris's heaven was yeah his wife's paintings, but he, he wants to find his kids because he knows that, that his kids are are there as well. Um, he finds the dog quite quickly, the Dalmatian, um, yeah. and it gets revealed that Cuba Gooding Jr. is his son, taking the the form of that 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 patient. Um, and then his daughter, strangely, was a, a flight attendant that he sort of hit on. I don't, I couldn't really get that. That was that was a strange part to me. Um, strange decision. It was interesting, not only with the representation of the children through other people, but also just the characters uh, themselves. I did like the conversation and it made me all also reflect uh, with his son, where the son was like, I'm not you. Um, and this is always going to be probably a conversation that you're going to have with your, your child when you push them to, to be better in the way that you think. And then ultimately, they have their own lives to live in the way that they want to, to do things which is potentially different than, than your own um, and not to stray from like moralistic side of things, but it made me reflect on my own raising of my child in that moment of like, you know, I, I, for example, I'm my daughter's in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as I am too. And I think that's a very useful tool, but it's like, ultimately there are going to be these things that I think are good that ultimately may a not be best for my own daughter. Um, and I think that's what the son was trying or was telling Chris, um, like, I'm not you, like, I'm, I'm not you, like, just stop. I think it's a good thing when, when eight or nine, or even a little after that, when identity is forming, you're pushing away your parents to some extent, you're becoming your own person. Yeah. Um, probably not answering your direct question, but I did like the representation of the kids. Um, 
both in the mixture, which became a little confusing to be fair um, when they were in hell. Uh, but just a representation overall, because um, I think I have to go back and watch the movie to see like who is who. Uh, yeah, yeah. Doing so, but um, I don't know. I just I really enjoyed it, even though that it was kind of like a Lord of the Rings Part Three. Um, what's the name of that? The remember. Return of the King? No. Yeah, The Return of the King. And um, yeah. it was uh, a little like that. Like, too you happy think they, go lucky, but it worked you think, well for me. Do you think that you like the ending? Do you think that... Because I could, the, end, it could have the ending been, is uh, all about could, reincarnation, right? Yeah, it and could have finding been. Themselves. That, yeah, that's that's ultimately why I you know, delved into the children who remember past lives. But um, yeah, it was good. I think it was it was shot like the Return of the King, where it's like very bright mm-hmm. uh, backgrounds and lights and things of that nature, and it's like lots of smiles, which is just like the Return of the King. And you're like, it's kind of like four smile. <laughs> everything's great here. Everyone just died. We went to hell, but everything's good. I don't know. Yeah. It, could it could it have been better? Yeah, I think uh, Coco's um, finish, of course, was was better. But um, I would say if the the my least favorite part was the ending of the whole movie. But I, I like the trek that it, it took to get there. And I do have a variety of things to share with you, for which I really appreciate these these quotes. Um, but Chris was talking to Annie and saying, so it's touching, but I can forgive you. And Annie's response was for, for killing my children and my sweet husband. And he just re- replies in a very Robin Williams way was, uh, for being so wonderful a guy who would choose hell over heaven just to hang around you. And I'm like, ah, wow. That's, if you really think about it, that's tolerating somebody quite well. There's a lot of, lot of love there. Um, and just so. That's not just toler- tolerating somebody. That's, <laughs> that's wanting. I'm joking with that. I'm going back to the tolerating moment. <laughs> it's just, um, it's so sad and, and really, truly. A moment that I I could I, I feel it really hit my heartstrings that Sony was crying at that moment, but um, it's sad. Um, yeah, there there was another quote in there that I liked a lot. Uh, dealing about death is, is you can hide from it, or you can understand it. Yeah, and I think a lot of people do, myself included, try to hide from it and not think about it. Um, but I think it is important to at least face face it and understand it yeah yeah and I, i'll read two more um albert and chris nielsen talking so what is the me well just the, the idea of just life or the idea of life and your thoughts um my brain i suppose your brain your brain is a body part like your fingernail or your heart why is that the part that's you chris robin williams says because I have a sort of voice in my head, the part of me that thinks, that feels, that is aware that I exist at all. So if you're aware you exist, then you do. That's why you're still here. And if you've ever had an, an existential crisis where you ultimately question everything in, in existence and your own decision-making process, this really hits home. And I, I think it hit home for me because it's like, am I alive? Am I not alive? What is this? Like, it, it, you know, can this be better? Did I make the right to stuff? Those types of things. Ultimately, you get to the point of like, well, you're either going to commit suicide or you're not. So move on with your life. And this type of comment is so funny to me because it's like the people that lose their heads trying to philosophize through the idea of what is life or the lack of life or whatever that might be kind of waking life. If you've ever you remember seeing that movie you're going to lose yourself if you continue down the path of like trying to figure this out. And it's a fun endeavor, but I think if you go too deep into it, you may lose your head. Um, But with that being said, I will leave you with one funny quote that I laughed out loud. It's so funny. It literally is so funny, but Annie, the wife, whenever (laughs) towards the end of the movie says a whole family lost the car crashes enough to make a person buy a bike. (laughs) 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 It's it's so true. Uh, a, little, a little moment of levity there. I like that. Yeah, I caught that yeah, too. That yeah. was funny. Um, I, and I forgot to actually tell a story about Sonia. Sonia actually, in terms of the painting, but Sonia wanted, I don't know what I've done to her to to make her feel so uh, 
uh, destructful of me. But basically, she had this idea that she wanted to shrink me to like eight inches. It's like a little me. And then fill up the bathtub with water and like create like just like a storm. And I'm like halfway drowning. And then she'd save me and then like throw me back in and then just do the storming. And I was like, what have I done to you? Like that (laughs) would deserve you to do this to me. And what kind of thoughts are you having right now? Like, uh, are you okay? (laughs) But was this a there, dream she had or just thoughts that she came up with on the spot? Thoughts in real life. <laughs> wow. It wasn't even a dream. But um, uh, but in that sense, she is saving you over and over again. Yeah. So there is. <laughs> I guess that's a good way to put it. But it made me and still makes me laugh. But also, uh, are, you, are, are we okay? Are you okay? You, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. Um, I, oh, yeah. One other little trivia tidbit, which I, I found to be very funny. Uh, Warner Her- Herzog was in the movie and in hell his face was was seen which I, I found very fascinating and interesting but the last bit I'll tell you before we, I can go to scoring when Chris goes to the city in heaven where people are flying around um, there's different characters flying around including P- uh, characters from Peter Pan Wendy Michael and John and Mary Poppins among the people flying uh, and Robin Williams as you know was in Hook who played Peter Pan which I did not pick up on even remotely did you didn't pick up, oh, I didn't pick up on that either. But when no. you were talking about movies that this kind of compared to Inception, I was thinking maybe it's just because of Robin Williams, but I did have that kind of feeling of hook. Um, the flying? Especially like, well, the, yeah, the flying. And then yeah. when he's, you know, walking around and it smudges paint um, mm. and, and what dreams may come felt like as well, uh, you know, hook. Uh, yeah, yeah, it had yeah. that, that same kind of similarity, I guess you say. Gotcha. That's all I have. Um, it was fun. Very fun week. I like the idea of the afterlife, uh, the concept. Rating these movies, I mean, Coco was easier to rate for me, but the What Dreams May Come, I really very much enjoy. Um, this was tough for me to rate. Um, and this is kind of one of the reasons like, why it's... N- now what I'm doing with these ratings is kind of my first impressions. Um, and after hearing your... You speak. That's what I always do. Yeah. yeah, that's what you always do. But I, it's it's always funny. Like after hearing you speak on these movies, or me kind of fleshing them out and verbalizing my thoughts, that's when like my 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 brain changes and says, "Wait, this was actually a little bit more nuanced than I thought," or "This was that." But what I'm doing now is I'm just going with my yeah. I go initial I go initial first. thoughts. I go first impressions. Um, I mean, I just I try to objectively. I try to objectively do it as as clean and precise as possible. Sometimes it's easier. I will say this, though. Uh, I was very curious of how we rate movies across the board and how you rate movies in particular. Um, and I've gone through all our, our podcast episodes. And basically, you have rated... So basically, vice versa. You have rated movies on four occasions. Um where I, you have rated my movie better on four occasions than your own, which is interesting. And I've actually done it nine times, eight times, uh, where I've rated your movie better than my own, meaning, quite clearly, I'm much more objective than you. You can, you can take that in different ways, but I'm, I definitely think I am. Maybe I'm picking better movies. <sighs> so that would be my, my point, but no. Um, it's, it's, it's not. You're just more objective. Got it. Yep. So... Do you want to go do Coco first, since it's your movie? Sure, Coco. Um, again, animation is it's very, very hard for me to to put this in context uh, for best performance. Um, I yeah, gave it a seventy five so- um, because I can't I can't honestly say that it's good, bad. Um, it was heartfelt, and I love this movie, Coco. Absolutely adore it. Um, but I'm not going to give it score I've ever heard. I don't yeah. understand. Se- 75. Uh, 90. I mean, it's just like so heartfelt um, and not just talking about the topic, but the way it's presented and all the character development, um, which, you know, for, I don't know what you rated. Um, let's go back. The boy and the heron. You actually rated Steven's score for... 
Uh, we've changed our. I mean, you rated it extremely well. So I did, yeah. I guess lo your logic has changed. I give it a ninety. I mean, the performance to me was excellent. You couldn't couldn't be any better. I mean, um, it could be better, but best quote. Uh, I really liked. Um, I like the quote, success doesn't come for free. You have to do what it, whatever it takes to seize your moment. Um, and that could go both ways. That could go yeah. the way of being selfish, um, as Ernesto was, or the way that Miguel had to seize his moment uh, to save his family or save his family's memories. Um, yeah. I gave it a 85. Also in 85. And also I had the, that exact same quote. And I love different derivation. It's kind of like um, you've heard it so frequently now, right? Like it's uh, yeah. you go to a dentist's office and you see it on a poster. But uh, I still am never sick of these types of quotes um, because they're very accurate and they're very telling. And that's why David Goggins has like such a platform. He basically is a, a regurgitation of quotes like this, of just like fucking get, getting after it. And um, I, I do appreciate anyway simply put I, I do like it so i gave it an 85 as well cool uh score um i mean this movie is based on music based on score um based on songs uh original songs um and i loved it i loved the 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 touches of the just the mexican heritage in the and and even in the, just the background kind of um score of it not in, not in the song so i give it a 90 I gave it a 95. I was like, this, it's almost perfect to me. I think, um, it was terrific. I mean, it's, you know, it's infused throughout the entire movie, but, um, some movies are infused as well, but suck. And, uh, this was definitely not a, a suck type of movie. Yeah. Screenplay. I thought it was a very solid screenplay. Um, Did it took a lot of editing. Oh, editing. Shoot. Editing so tough for me. Um, I gave it an 80. I thought it was great. Um, but not anything that I really remember. It's tough to, to, I mean, I gave it a 90, but it's tough to rate. Um, Cause like what editing is actually happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like for you're not patching scenes together of like people who have acted, but I still give it a 90. I, I try to take the same or a, a different logic, but the same methodology of like piecing scenes together. I gave it a 90. Um, took a while for the screenplay to come, come around. They had to do a lot of different variations, uh, but the story, just the way that it built, like I said, with that kind of that twist that happens and realizing who the actual villain is. Um, it's fantastic. 85. I gave it a 90, um, which I also gave a 90 for, for directing, but the screenplay, I, I could have also probably given it a 95. I thought it was absolutely terrific. Great writing. Just loved it. Um, like the twist um, visually, just overall, the, the movie was great. It was lovely. Yeah. D directing this is, again is hard for me to to quantify um the choices in the in the directing um but i love the visual style of it i love the actual idea of what they did to create the day of the, the land of the dead um the the skeletons one of the toughest things they said was trying to like give character to these skeletons and i thought they did a good hard, job on right? that without skin yeah yeah um i gave it i probably should have bumped this up but i gave it an 80 it's very strange your scoring methodology um but nonetheless um i gave it i gave it 90 what dreams may come i the performance was terrific for me for both cuba Gooding jr and robin just i love them just i i like the i thought they crushed so i gave them both i would put there in, in this field of 90 cool i i agree with that i think cuba Gooding jr has that um that that stare that he can give yeah. to somebody of like this means something do it um and not many people have that and then just robin williams that kind of like smile that is just about to burst but not quite that he can just do is is incredible um i gave it an 85 i think the performances were great the quotes i mean i've, I've gone through the quotes that I thought were both funny and, and meaningful, but I, I gave that a 90 as well. I just, I really, really like the quotes. There's a ton of other quotes as well that could have added, but um, I didn't tell them here. I like that. I, I agree with you. I love the quotes. I, I think uh, 
the ideas of this movie and the quotes that they, they provide, like we've talked about a lot of the quotes on here. Um, fantastic. I gave it an 85. Um, so the score editing, I both gave an 80. The score, while good at times, it just it wasn't um there wasn't a cocoa, for example. So uh and then the editing, which I think with what they had to deal with in reference to the different scenes and literally having a painting where Robin Williams is included in a painting. Um, I thought the editing was pretty good. I, I kind of took a different path on this. Uh, there's some movies where the score is, is leading you and, and helping drive the narrative. And there's other scores that are telling you what to feel. And I don't like scores that are telling me what to feel. And this one does that. Um, so I gave it a 70. Got it. Screenplay and directing, I, I both gave an 85. Um, I like the idea of this movie, even though the first few minutes is like horrendous. I haven't read the book, so I, I, I don't know exactly the ramifications there. But I just like the idea of the, the, the fall, the cell, inception, just the weirdness of realities being mix, mixed and mashed. Um, and I just think that Robin Williams and Cuba Gooding Jr. were able to really bring out the screenplay quite well. So I gave it an, it's an 86 overall for me. Cool. Um, I got uh, screenplay writing. I like the quotes more than I like the screenplay. Um, and yeah, it's, it's mainly due to, I think that they, they could have given you, like you said, having a Korean director, like I think the ending of this film would be just so yeah, much different. better, different. Um, I don't like the, the tie bow, uh, they're going to both be reincarnated. Le- who yeah. cares about the kids? Leave them in heaven. We'll see them later. Yeah. Um, it's just so, yeah, I, I gave 80, 80. Um, I think the direction was great. I think the world building uh, is incredible in this film um, in both films. Uh, the world building is great. So, yeah, I love, I love nice worlds. Um, but I would like to see this movie done re- or redone. I should say, what is next week? What are we doing? What are One we- man show? Yeah. One man show. So you have chosen. Have you chosen? You never replied to me. Got a lot. Got a lot on my plate, Jonathan. Got a lot on my plate. So um, I'm thinking it's going to be locked. Team manager but joke. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even mean to do a pun, but I did. Just served <laughs> it right there. Um, I'm thinking about lock. You're thinking? Can you definitively it's between, tell me? It's, it's between lock and moon. Um, lock. Lock. It is. And choosing for you lock it in so uh, so lock i w- we were debating on whether or not this is a one-man show because there's other people included in it and i was actually thinking of literal one-man shows like a literal one-man show so we yeah. were differing on the definition but i i thought actually these two would work well together i have chosen swimming to cambodia who i think is maybe my favorite storyteller of all time in terms of a being like an orator, maybe my fo- favorite storyteller of all time. And I don't want you to watch anything to do with this movie. No trailers or anything like yeah. that. Just embrace it for what it is. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. But one man show. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a film that's not available anywhere on streaming. Can't download it. So I had to buy a DVD. I haven't done one of that. I haven't done as did wow. I. I don't know how I watched it before, but I, I have seen it multiple times and I, I can't remember how. But um, nonetheless, I, I have purchased you uh, your Our Next For You movie. One in which I, I have seen the trailer, I understand, but I actually haven't seen the entire movie itself. But I want you to, uh, and myself, to embrace it. Uh, to give you, I'll give you the smallest of background that is irrelevant, but it's got like 94% of Rotten Tomatoes. Let's do this if, if we can, if we can sync it up. Let's um, both watch the movie at the same time and do the podcast right after that. You want to do one single movie? Uh, I, I, think, I think this for you film, you've talked about doing it as a one single film. Not this one. Kind of a re- no. Or we could just call this a, the, a reaction pod to one film. Okay. You could do that. Yeah. That'd be fun. Interesting. Hey, uh, you guys can follow us at Scene Weekly. Uh, That is our at. Uh, We are on Twitter, X, Instagram, OnlyFans, all of the above. Do you have an OnlyFans? (laughs) Feet Finder. (laughs) You you didn't know that, Feet Finder. That's us. Follow us. Goodbye. Goodbye.